Well, it's October, which officially means it's my favorite time of the year. The advent of fall immediately brings several pieces of fiction to mind, like The Nightmare Before Christmas, Resident Evil 4, and Luigi's Mansion, just to name a few. I love all of these for one reason or another, but there's always been one game that illustrated the true essence of autumn to me, and that game is... <coughs> Pokemon Black and White? I mean, yeah, it came out in September, and technically that's autumn, but there's not a single spook to be found! The I Goosebumps Attack of the Munich game is scarier than that! In all its late 90s PC graphical glory. <laughs> the thing is that autumn is such a magical time to me because it encompasses not only the greatness that is spooky season, which signifies the return of horror elements, but it similarly sweeps in a period of ambience and serenity along the color of the leaves. Over the Garden Wall and Animal Crossing are great examples of the spot, with their vivid imagery and soundtracks rife with classical as well as folk elements, giving off an air of nostalgia. Pokemon Black and White manages to capture my sensibilities for similar reasons. If I'm being perfectly honest, the hardest part about scripting this video was putting into words what fall represents to me, but trying my best, it's this sense of comfort that flows in with the strong atmosphere as we ride toward the finish line of the year. It's that aura of comfort that makes me feel reflective and perceptive of things that weren't necessarily evident to me originally. Certainly, the introduction of Seasons to the Pokémon series went a long way to bolster the sentiment, but it's also because I consider Autumn to be this gateway into an inviting and immersive world, a world that I believe Pokémon Black and White captures magnificently. There's something extraordinarily captivating about these entries in the franchise, and I find a great portion of that feeling comes from all the small details planted into the fifth generation titles, which by themselves are merely cute additions, but together culminate into something exceptional. For that reason, I wanted to dive into the Unova region and note my personal favorite details that I believe give Unova its charm and cozy vibe, fitting at this time of the year. As a disclaimer, I will be primarily focused on the particulars of Black and White, not so much its sequels, but I will make the occasional reference when it feels necessary. With that being said, get cozy for an examination of Black and White's intricacies, and let's go visit the world of Pokémon. My history with Pokémon Black and White is a bit of a peculiar one. When the Generation 5 installments released back in September 2010, I was a freshman in high school and there was a lot of excitement. All of my friends had picked up their version of choice, mine being white version, and we would always talk about our team or what new Pokemon we particularly loved. Now, it's been over 10 years since that initial playthrough, and while I remember enjoying my journey through the Unova region, I also distinctly recall coming away from the experience believing it was the weakest Pokemon entry. I thought the region was too linear. Only having the new ensemble of Pokemon available before finishing the game was dumb and didn't like the open-ended Elite Four? I was a dumb teenager, okay? However, I've always loved replaying Pokemon games, and I wanted to give the game another chance since maybe there was something I was missing. A few months later, I played for the main story again, and came away appreciating what Black and White was immensely more. After some more time had passed, I played the game a third time, and it was at that moment I realized, maybe this was my favorite Pokemon game. And it's this mindset where Black and White always presents you with a new fresh outlook or perspective on things that really garner my attention and I believe embodies what the game does. Now, Pokemon games have been known for introducing a new mechanic each generation, which shakes up the standard formula to some degree. Some of these are additions that don't inherently affect the world itself, like the godsend that are the running shoes introduced in Ruby and Sapphire, while others are larger in scale and responsible for world building to some degree, such as the day and night cycle from Gold and Silver. Black and White is no exception to this trend, and manages to follow the latter notion by introducing a mechanic which merges the principles of world building and gameplay innovation into one entity. That mechanic is the seasonal cycle. The most noticeable change brought by the seasons is of course the continually changing aesthetics, which makes Unova feel more alive than previous regions in addition to keeping the experience relatively fresh. The reason for this being that Unova's seasonal cycle isn't a perfect recreation of what we are familiar with in reality. The order of winter, spring, summer, and fall remains the same, however each season will only last a month before moving to the next. 
Furthermore, these seasons are all linked to specific months. So spring occurs during January, May, and September. Summer comes with February, June, and strangely October. That's besides the point. Although most of my replays are finished in a period shorter than a month, I can't express how nice of an option it is to influence the present season by changing the clock on the DS whenever I want. Starting a playthrough in autumn and you want the game to reflect reality? Go for it. Getting sick of the snow and want to escape to a sun-bathed world? Just make it summer. And there are so many little artistic details within this system, like the fluttering petals on Route 1, or piles of leaves flooding the terrain that makes it feel like Game Freak undoubtedly cared about this world. Aesthetics go a long way into successful world building, yet seasons also have gameplay effects as I mentioned. Just like previous day and night cycles, on a selection of 8 routes, or 9 if you're playing Pokemon Black and White 2, the encounter rates of some Pokemon will change depending on the season. For example, on Route 6 of Black and White, the pool of Pokemon will be Deerling, Carablast, Tranquil, Fungus, and Swadloon for Spring through Autumn. However, in Winter, Tranquil will be replaced by Vanillite, and not just because it's an Ice type, but Tranquil would have likely flown south for the winter. Yes, I'm getting excited over a bird doing bird things, but there's just something about it that feels cohesive with the game's vision. Now, admittedly, the depth to this rarity system is rather shallow, which is why I'd love to see Seasons return in a future installment, but that doesn't take away from some of the charming details that do exist. Continuing with that, seasonal changes can influence the way players will progress through certain routes or make small areas reachable that never were before. In the wintertime, good luck finding Pokemon in the various marshlands as they'll now be converted into the bane of every child under the age of eight. Ice puzzles. In Black and White 2, massive piles of leaves will make several items that were unreachable, well, reachable. The Castellia sewers will be dried up or filled to the brim with water during the flood seasons of spring and summer, with each version permitting access to areas like the back alley or various rooms. Even with everything that's been said, there's still even more minutia, like the duration of morning and day beginning at different times depending on the season. Castellia cones can't be purchased at the stand in winter. N, like the secretly extra man that he is, will have bloody seasonal wardrobes, except it's Pokemon teams instead of clothes. It's unbelievable. Yet that's exactly why seasons are such a brilliant addition to the series in my eyes. But all of these pale in comparison to one of my favorite details in the Generation 5 titles. I'm gonna go ahead and make a grandiose statement, but in my opinion, this is one of the greatest soundtracks ever conceived. Now, a lot of my opinion is rooted in subjectivity, as I have a large personal attachment to the soundtrack, something I will address later. However, the amount of effort placed into crafting this soundtrack is phenomenal, and a great part of what makes Black and White's collection of music so fantastic. Let's start with how the seasons incorporate musical elements to give Unova personality. Pokemon routes were known for having a static theme attached to them until the advent of Diamond and Pearl, when new nighttime variants of each area's song were implemented. An addition I absolutely love since it helps set the mood and breathes life into these areas. I'm also just a Xenoblade fan, and that's kind of standard for the series. Generation 5 abandoned the nighttime variants, but instead implemented seasonal music variants that are split into several different categories. Here's a visualization of their breakdown, but let's take a look at the shifts in instrumentation for the Route 2 to Sky Arrow Bridge range. The flutes in the springtime emanate a whimsical, lively vibe that is fitting for the season of new beginnings. Summer, as a season defined by freedom and growth, has the loudest arrangement of them all. As for the fall, a piano marks the drop in energy from the summer as the temperature and foliage begin to dwindle, while still retaining a level of mellowness and comfort. Finally, that brings us to the winter arrangement, which implements chimes into the intro, possibly symbolizing a faintness in the world that comes with the cold air and snow, yet returning with a flourish of magic. These different compositions mingle with the visual changes in such a way that makes Unova such a fun, immersive fictional space to dive into. And I would be remiss to not mention my personal favorite of these variants, Undela Town. 
Tucked away within the postgame, Undela Town is a spot for respite after a long journey and has two compositions. In the summer, Undela Bay is a bumpin' tropical song that would make Mario Kart 64's Koopa Bo Koopa Boopa, <laughs> Koopa Troopa Beach jealous. For every other month, Undela Town is filled with a somber, reflective air as the slow melody accompanied by the relaxing sound of waves plays. Although I prefer the non-summer variant, it only works so well because of the dichotomy that exists between these two arrangements. One's full of vibrance, the other is melancholic, and yet they both occupy the same space. That, to me, is a shining example of how significant the music is to defining the mood of a given environment. Despite most of the discussion revolving around the seasons, the utilization of these small musical beats extends way past this mechanic. The seasonal arrangements are certainly proof of it, but the best way to describe Unova's music is that it's dynamic. For instance, a great number of routes will add an extra instrument to what you hear whenever the player is moving. With the exception of Route 1, which throws in a tambourine when the player moves, all of the others will include a snare drum. This was a discovery I didn't make until I streamed the game over a year ago, and I can't help but feel appreciative that a game I've beaten several times can still find new ways to surprise me. Nevertheless, it doesn't stop there. The element of Unova's kinetic music that's always remained my favorite is its integration into town areas. Let's use Accumula Town as an example, which most people likely know as the Furtwalk song. You're coming hot off the heels of Route 1, and then you're greeted with... A rather nice piece that might have you thinking, okay. That's a pretty catchy theme for a Pokemon game second town. That's like Old Dale Tear, not bad. Maybe you start exploring the town, you mosey on up the stairs in the top right until you find yourself in a room with a guy on the drums and a girl on the piano. Do you want to listen to my drum? Yeah, okay, whatever. My heart, as long as my heart beats, I will keep on drumming. Okay, yeah, that's cool, dude. Go ahead and, oh, 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 oh wait, hold up, that's pretty clean. Hey, you on the piano, hit those keys. Yeah! <laughs> so, aside from the fact that it just sounds amazing, let's examine the other reasons why this tidbit works. First off, you are rewarded for exploration but in an interesting fashion that's not just your typical TM or medicinal item. Second, the interaction between the player and the game is extremely unique. In my research on video game immersion, I found a text called Video Games, Perspective, Point of View, and Immersion by Laurie Ann Taylor that claims video game play is understood experientially through visual and auditory presentation. Video game design focuses chiefly on the visual register of play and, within the visual, on the act of scene for the game's presentation, often ignoring the other aspects of the visual register and degrading the auditory to only a supporting role. Essentially, this means that the experience of playing a game can be broken into two components, what you see and what you hear. However, what you see will usually become the lead variable in the progression of play, while what you hear will occupy the background space. For a handful of case scenarios, yeah, that makes sense. In Mega Man, seeing what attacks my opponent is using as well as where I am on the screen is more significant to play in the game than the music in the background as good as it may be. But with the placement of NPC musicians that can directly modify the music by means of the player's actions, those auditory components aren't playing a fully supporting role anymore. Mother 3 manifests this concept to a much greater effect as it's applicable to every battle, but this minor set of interactions from black and white can lead to greater immersion as the line between the player and the created world is blurred. Like, that is so cool. And it's not even just a Cumula Town. In both Black and White, as well as their sequels, there are seven different locations that have this same design mentality. If you haven't, I highly recommend giving each of these a listen to hear the differences for yourself. Alright, the last thing on the subject of small musical variations comes in the form of Chargestone Cave and Twist Mountain, which will have the music slow, and the notes will become lower the deeper you descend into the depths. The melody feels suffocating and lethargic the farther you go, which, just like all the other musical variations, is incredibly effective at setting the tone and giving each area an identity. Black and white soundtrack 
It just has everything. Route 10, Castellia and Driftvale City, Dragon Spiral Tower, Emotion, the list just keeps going. Whenever I need a soundtrack to relax to or clear my head, Black and White's is my go-to. And it's my contemplative mentality that I relate so heavily to Autumn Time. The last matter I'd like to discuss in regard to small elements building towards a larger, immersive world are the version differences between Pokemon Black and White. Just like I've previously stated, the Generation 5 titles continue the legacy established by their predecessors with the inclusion of previous systems and design choices. When talking about version differences, we're usually talking about the exclusive Pokemon split across the two games, such as Mandibus's exclusive status in Black version, while Braviary acts as its foil in White version. But, as usual, Black and White strive to advance the series, adding more version differences in various means that seek to reinforce the themes of the respective game. Within the narrative itself, there is a great deal of lore concerning the box art legendaries Reshiram and Zekrom. The former represents the concept of truth, while the latter aligns with an idealistic view. Although I don't believe these two values to be mutually exclusive, they can be considered as distinct viewpoints. Truth is rooted in realism. It's something that's intended to be passed down from generation to generation, which is why the older brother in the Unovan origin story aligns with Reshiram. Ideals, on the other hand, are contingent on belief and look toward the future with a sense of optimism and passion, which is fitting for the younger brother who Zekrom sided with. Even if we look at Reshiram and Zekrom themselves, their secondary typings of fire and electric respectively are representative of their particular value. Fire as a symbol of enlightenment and wisdom in various cultures ties into the grounded quality of truth. Electric, typically associated with technology and advancement, connects to the innovative and visionary characteristics of ideals. These notions of truth and ideals infiltrate the Unova region's design, and usually through the lens of the most developed character in the story, Ed whose arc is centered around searching for purpose. In Pokemon Black, he allies with Zekrom, so certain areas take on the form of that idealistic, futuristic approach. In Pokemon White, Reshiram is his partner, which gives those same areas a more rustic flavor. Likely the most well-known of these would be the series' first fully version exclusive locations, Black City and White Forest, which are entered in the postgame. Visually, they are remarkably different, and Black City will focus on battling fully evolved Pokemon as opposed to the wild encounters against their base forms in White Forest. Yet again, another instance of the young versus old theme. The design of Miss Trollton City uses the same blueprint for both versions, but there is a small difference in the area outside the fence to the left of the landing strip. Black version will have greenhouses as a form of technological advancement, while white version will have modest patches of soil. It serves no function, but it's just a cute detail nonetheless. The personal standout to me is the home of the final gym badge, Opelucid City, which again has a shared blueprint, but the differences are much greater. These changes can actually be witnessed first in their description, with Opelucid City being referred to as Time's Dividing Line. In Black and Black 2, it is also described as a convenient city of rapid change, showing no traces of the past, while in White and White 2, it is called a city that respects history and values old things. From a visual standpoint, Pokemon White's depiction is coated in a sea of stone. The streets are created from organic materials with vegetation seeping through the cracks. The city is built around the natural geography as evident by the numerous staircases used to scale the small hills around the city. A fountain rests in the city square as a show of respect for nature, and most of the buildings are also constructed from stone with a sizable number of trees surrounding them. The beige and green color scheme of the town fully sells that idea of a city that holds its identity in the natural beauty of the world, and pays respects to the Dragon of Truth. The Opelucid City from Pokemon Black is exceedingly different, fully embodying the industrialized and synthetic aesthetic. This time, the roads take on a sleeker, even more concrete build. The city has been completely leveled, ditching the stairs and hills from White Virgin's depiction. The number of trees and hedges has been reduced in favor of more buildings and fences as artificial barriers. The fountain has been removed, two construction sites infiltrate the town space instead of the one spot from White Virgin, and the buildings are composed of colder metals, fitted with blue windows and sliding doors. There are also a handful of smaller changes, like Black Virgin containing two vending machines as opposed to the one from white version, and the addition of street lights to black. Finally, the blue and gray hue of this portrayal fully capture the mindset of a forward-thinking individual, and that of the Dragon of Ideals, with even the blue mimicking Zekrom's electricity. 
Game Freak did an excellent job of pushing the design elements for the different versions to their limits in both subtle and obvious ways that bolster Gen 5's core themes. Yet, the differences do not stop there. If the city's visual presentation wasn't the first indication that Opelucid sets itself apart from the bunch, then the music would be. The theme of Opelucid City for both Pokemon Black and White uses the same basis and progression. However, the instrumentation and speed of each arrangement is extraordinarily different, helping to further cement the respective identity. Pokemon White incorporates a piano and what sounds like a xylophone, while Pokemon Black opts for Sim City. Similar to Accumula Town, you can speak to specific NPCs who will add a new instrument to the song and can be heard so long as you're within earshot of them. Yet that instrument is completely unique to the version you're playing. Pokemon White has a woman playing what is called an Urhu, an instrument composed of two strings and played with a bow. The instrument's history is tied to China's and is recognized for its wide range of emotion, almost like a human, which allows it to manifest feelings of sadness or melancholy with its wistful nature. And I think that is perfect for White Version's preference for the natural and the song's slower, more pensive melody. In the same spot in Pokemon Black will be a man playing the guitar, a synthesizer instrument characterized by its similar appearance to a guitar, but with the use of keys instead of strings. Although the instrument has a history dating back quite some time in the guise of different forms, the guitar as we know it today is relatively new and acts as a branching evolution of the keyboard. The sound is much less organic than that of the Urhu, and carries much less of a long-spanning cultural significance, which separates itself from Opelucid City from Pokemon White's desire for upholding tradition. It's also a lot more energetic, which is perfectly fitting for the bouncy, vibrant arrangement in Black version. If you asked me several years ago, I would have told you that White version's theme was undoubtedly the better version. Yet recently, I've greatly come to enjoy the unique flavor provided by Black version's theme. I still prefer whites by just a hair, but I believe it's important to appreciate how composer Go Ichinose managed to forge two distinctly feeling tunes using the same basis. The final point of interest with Opelucid City's design is the gym and its leader, with the latter actually varying per version. The gym sports a black and white coloration both on the exterior and interior, which is pretty on the nose given not only the names of the games themselves, but Opelucid City's split design choice. In Black and White 2, Drayden takes the role of gym leader for both versions, since Iris is promoted to the Unovan champion. With everything I've mentioned about White version embodying themes of old and tradition, and Black epitomizing youthfulness, I find it especially bizarre that Iris is the gym leader in White and Drayden is the gym leader in Black. This result could be passed off as a decision made without taking the themes into consideration. But I have another thought. Opelucid City Gym's visual design is all about merging black with the white, and possibly by extension, the truth with the ideals, the old with the new. At the end of the day, Black and White's message is that there can exist a happy balance between the two, and things aren't always so, well, black and white. And there's no further proof of this than N. His dialogue is dependent on the version as he will act as the personification of the beliefs that is opposite to the game's color. In White Version, following his defeat at End's Castle, he'll say, Reshram and I were beaten. Your ideals, your feelings, they were stronger than mine. With ideals shifting to truth in Black. Just like the Legend of Unova, Black and White's narrative follows two people fighting over their beliefs, and both N and the player act as the spiritual successors to the Brothers of Legend. It's the dichotomy between the two games that shows that neither perspective is 100% right, but it's the justification as well as the ability to understand why someone would try to uphold tradition or strive for innovation. This was a long tangent, but back on the subject of the 8th gym, perhaps having the younger figure of Iris in the game with the opposite theme was intentional. Maybe it represents the merging of these ideas. I could be giving it too much credit, but Black and White were titles I previously never gave enough credit to, when I really should have. I said earlier that Black and White was a game that I had a history of ups and downs with, but I ultimately came to realize that I was looking at the game through the lens of my narrow-mindedness. I would be lying if I said this was the first time I've done as such, and it connects to a personal story. When I was younger, my dad, as well as an old friend of mine and his dad, would go to a car show stationed on the grounds of an old historical home. I've never been too interested in cars, so I would instead go walk around the gardens behind the manor with my friends until we could finally go home. 
I enjoyed the various gardens, but they were mainly a means to an end. Something to hold my attention until it was time to head home. Eventually, we stopped going to those car shows and visiting the manor altogether. Years later, I'm in college and on my fall study break. On my way back to the city I used to live in, I had this strong desire to revisit that manor. Three friends and I journeyed there one fall afternoon. I walked through the gardens for the first time in what must have been seven years, and it was magical. This thing that I was once indifferent to had morphed into something I viewed with great admiration. I try my best to revisit that same manor every year when I can, and don't get me wrong, the place looks beautiful when decorated for winter, but my preference has always been to walk those gardens during the fall. Every time I go there, I can practically hear the black and white soundtrack in my head, and it puts me at ease. Autumn is oftentimes referred to as the season of change as the vibrancy of summer slowly transforms into the snow-cloaked isolation of winter, but funnily enough, that change means more to me. I believe that's exactly why black and white is this experience that means so much and one that embodies exactly what the spirit of autumn is to me. Hello everybody, welcome to the end of the video and thank you so much for watching. This video was honestly kind of a nightmare to edit because I was working with all four seasons which required changing the clock on my computer constantly as well as working across like three to four different games. I was working with not only white but also black to get the footage of the version differences but also seeing the new stuff in black and white too. So yeah, cutting it pretty close here with the release date. That being said, if you did enjoy this video, then it would be very much appreciated if you left a like and considered subscribing to the channel. We are so close to my goal of 10k by the end of the year, and I honestly think it is possible to hit. Pokemon Black and White is something that I've wanted to cover on this channel since I first started back in 2019. I just couldn't really get the right time in order to tackle it, but I'm glad I was finally able to, and I certainly will be tackling this again in the future, just with better foresight and less season changes. Anyways, that's really all I have to say, so thank you for watching once again, thank you for all the support, happy Halloween, and until next time.